Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Hey, this is Ellen on the tropical island of St. Bart's, and today we discuss budget-friendly lighting equipment on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. And sister. You better believe that, Ellen. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Is this 343 or 344? I don't know. Or is it episode maybe. 345? No, I thought it wasn't last week 342. Oh, then maybe it is. Welcome to episode 343. <laughs> and today we actually have a special guest. We have David Henry of Learn Stage Lighting to join us to discuss this topic, which is budget lighting equipment. Exactly. Hey, David, where are you calling from today? Hi, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Ah, one of my favorite towns. Great music town, Nashville. Love it, love it, love it, love it. What's the weather like? It is actually a really nice fall right now. Um, I grew up in the Northeast, and I love a good fall. Um, here, a good fall means it's like 80 degrees, but it's not humid. Um, it's really nice. <laughs> I got it, I got it. <laughs> Ellen, why don't you tell us a little bit about David? I think I'll do that. David Henry fell into lighting and AV when he found out he could skip church services to volunteer in AV with his youth group at a ripe young age. From there, he's gone on to see most sides of the industry, including community theater, fashion, corporate events, live music, church events, and more. In 2012, David started Learn Stage Lighting to teach other people new to lighting what he had learned. Today, that has grown into a small company where he helps people find and acquire the right lights and learn how to use them well. In addition, David consults with multiple manufacturers and teaches live training and has produced numerous video courses available through Learn Stage Lighting Labs. And his motto is, you don't have to have a big budget to create great lighting. You don't have to have a ton of experience. What you do need, however, is some knowledge and tips that will catapult you to lighting mastery. And there you have it. Well, well, that's some good advice there, right there. <laughs> so, David, uh, you've been a listener to Light Talk for a while? Yeah, I think, I really think that I started listening back at the start or very close to it. And I've heard most many episodes. I'm not saying I don't occasionally skip one when, <laughs> when I, I get behind in the podcast, but I, I've listened to a lot of them. Actually, I have a, a, hopefully you'll think it's funny, Light Talk anecdote, which is that, um, you know, a few years ago, I mean, maybe it's more than a few years ago, um, I got a new pair of headphones and I was just flip, you know, flipped them in my ears to listen to the podcast on, you know, the next morning or whatever. And light talk comes on and I'm like, wow, my old headphones must have been terrible because there are instruments in this theme song that I've never heard before. It, it blew my mind. And of course, that was the week when you guys had uh, the guys, I think it was Zach, start to right. add some new parts right. in the He's song in the <laughs> a few years ago. Yeah. And it was <laughs> it just it was hilarious when you guys announced that because I just went from, wait. Oh. <laughs> oh, so it wasn't the headset at all. No, not at all. But we should have a little competition. We should have a competition. So the first listener to name all the instruments used in the Light Talk theme song wins a fez or something like that. Because there, there are some tricky instruments that are used in that theme song. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say about it. But great. It's great to have you here. It's great to have a, uh, a longtime listener. And it's also great to have an expert in budget lighting equipment. Because we've been talking about this for a while. Because Steve, Stan, and I are, are spoiled. I mean, we, we get to use you know, a lot of the top-end lighting equipment that costs like Ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a fixture, things like that. But there are a lot of, you know, co uh, uh, community groups and small theater companies and educational uh, organizations that can't afford that. So, how did you get involved in the um, in the budget lighting sales business? <laughs> budget lighting. I don't, sales know. I don't know how to put it. Boy, that sounds like I'm selling them out of the back of my car. How about cost effective? <laughs> How's that? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've always had, I guess, you know, to bring in the story of Learn Stage Lighting a little bit when, I, as I was telling Steve before we started recording, you know, we started it in 2012, but really it, it grew to a point in about 2015 where, you know, people were writing into me asking all these questions and it was taking up enough of my time 
that I said, okay, this thing either has to become like its own viable thing that like produces some income because I don't have time to do this alongside of doing lighting for shows full time, um, or we just need to kill it off. Um, and so we didn't kill it off. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the expertise, the, the place in the world that I found that really wasn't represented well was someone teaching folks who weren't at the professional level and who also weren't DJs like, like at that time. And even today, like a lot of the manufacturer based stuff, like is like all towards DJs or all towards professional users. And there's a whole gamut of people in the, in between there. Right. There's people, you know, in their churches, you know, those continue to to raise, um, you know, how well they do production and, and the kind of things they do. You know, community theaters obviously do great stuff, but it's a very different world from professional theater, um, especially in terms of that old budget thing we're talking about here today. You know, bands and, and others, you know, want to be able to have a great show. And obviously, because, you know, we're not dragging out par 64s to gigs anymore, the, the tools have improved greatly. Um, and so, you know, we kind of fell into this place a, as just a website and then business of helping people at that basic to intermediate level. And so that's how we became, <laughs> how I became, as you say, a budget lighting salesman, just, uh, you know, pulling the, the latest, uh, you know, Parkan 5000 out of the trunk to uh, sell to you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there Parkan 5000? <laughs> I didn't no. know about that new <laughs> instrument. <laughs> no, but it could be from one of your commercials on the show. I, I think it is. I think it is. Oh my God, Steve, I think you thought came up with that. The, the, the Parkan 5000. So David, what what makes a budget light a budget light? What Where is that sweet spot and price and breakdown? You know, I mean, ultimately, you know, today we have more options than ever before. Like, you know, there is stuff that I would not recommend you buy at the low end of the spectrum. There's a lot of stuff in the middle, you know, and really there's a really good solid continuum between kind of what we call budget, but reliable, you know, <laughs> kind of the bottom, right? That's good. The bottom we would recommend people going with, like, you know, we're not ever, I don't ever want to recommend someone go buy something that's not going to be reliable. Um, and that, you know, all the way up to the professional level, um, there really are options in kind of every price range, which is really cool. You know, how much stuff is out there. I know, obviously we'll all be the four of us, at least we'll be walking around LDI with, you know, a couple, a couple thousand of our closest friends. Um, and you know, we're going to see this, right. Um, you know, there's, there are, you know, hundred to $200 led par cans at the time of this recording that are actually really pretty nice. Um, you know, and it, you know, it goes all the way up to the professional level stuff that you guys are working with that might be made by, you know, ETC or somebody else. Um, and so I think what, what separates a budget model from a different model is, I mean, you think about price first, right? Obviously, you know, that's kind of the first thing people go for. Um, they're like, hey, we want to do this kind of stuff, but we only have so much money. And so, you know, the way that I like to think of it and the way I kind of see it looking across the industry is if you're going to, you know, say you have a light that you know, you know, hey, this professional theater uses it. I've seen it. I want something like that. You know, whether it's a moving light, a, a fixed, a non-moving light, a wash fixture, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you're going to come down and budget from there, then you're going to get kind of you're going to kind of balance features. So you're going to get you may find something with less features. You know, maybe in your instance, you don't need Zoom, but the light you were initially looking at had Zoom. Well, that can actually save a pretty good amount of cost, right? Um, you, you know, there's going to be a le less light quality or efficiency. So when you're stepping down from, you know, the, the higher end of the professional grade stuff that you're seeing in a professional venue, um, it, you know, a 200 watt LED from one of these high end manufacturers compared to something from a little bit more budget minded model is not going to be as bright, even though it's the same wattage. It's not going to be as efficient. Typically, um, you, you're going to see, you may see, it depends. You may see less build quality. Um, you know, that's really a fixture by fixture thing. Like uh, sometimes, a lot of times, if something is in a permanent install, you know, it doesn't have to have a high level of build quality, right? It could have some cheaper plastics and things like that and still perform and do the job really well. 
Um, and then the last, the last thing that you get, uh, I would say with a budget light, and this hopefully won't make people laugh too hard or offend too many of the manufacturers we're dealers for, but, um, they spend less on marketing. <laughs> <laughs> And as much as we love marketing and it's, you know, a positive thing to get the word out about those fixtures, um, you know, obviously there, there are some companies in this industry that spend a ton on marketing and they have great fixtures, but, you know, oftentimes on a budget going and finding a brand that makes reliable fixtures, uh, which is actually kind of what kicked this off. Uh, you guys were talking about Megalite and, but, you know, doesn't spend, you know, probably as much ad marketing as, as the big guys. Uh, can be a really great buy for you. Yeah, be careful because that's how Ellen makes her money is in marketing. So <laughs> I know, be, I know, be right? real careful here because you may disappear all of a sudden. <laughs> well, where'd David go? <laughs> no, let, let me ask a follow up, and then I'll get out of the way here for Ellen and uh, David. Um, so, in in the work you're doing, have you found there is still a problem with delivery? Has has the budget industry gotten back on its feet enough to make delivery in a timely fashion? I know some of the bigger companies are still struggling with that. Yeah. So in terms of like back order dates, um, what we find a lot of the times is, and, and don't tell anybody this, but throughout this whole thing, uh, you know, the past couple of years, uh, a lot of times the budget brands that don't do as much marketing actually had shorter back order times. Um, not all the time. Um, but honestly, you know, in terms of equipment sales and what we're seeing right now across all the brands is that that availability has gotten a lot better than it was. I mean, sure. And, and I say that of course, and we are right now in the crux of that airplane parts thing going on that is affecting delivery times right now, um, for anything airship that that started ha coming in about a week or two ago. But in general, like compared to two years ago where like, you know, it was hard to find lights in stock, period. You know, manufacturers and other warehouses have fixtures in stock. Yeah, if it's a high demand fixture, it's probably going to be back ordered. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I mean, it was not uncommon for us to reach out to a manufacturer, check in a dashboard on a fixture. And it would be like, oh, yeah, you'll get that in nine months. You'll get that in two years, you know, whatever. Um, and today, that's typically not the case. On some things it still is, but it's it's gotten a lot better. Is there a typical lighting package for a church or a club? And to sort of add to that, when you start consulting with a group, do you ask them what their budget is or do you try to come up with something that they might then work with? Absolutely. So I think the budget conversation and asking people for a budget is one of those things that's hard to do, right? Because... I think the psychology of it leans like, you know, hey, this this guy on the other end is asking us for our budget and he's just going to go, you know, spend, you know, if we say we have ten thousand dollars, he's going to make his his sale for ten thousand dollars. Exactly. Right. He's just going to use 100 percent of that. Right. You know, that's kind of the the psychological thing. Sometimes I think people think. Um, so what we like to do is we like to talk to people um, and. Um, there's not a typical lighting package for a church or a venue or anything like that, um, because, you know, everybody's needs are different, but I would say there are definitely like when we're lighting a band and we see about the size of the stage or we're lighting a church and we see about the throw distance we're looking at and we start to get that info from them. You know, we have three or four models of fixtures that we tend to gravitate to the most. Um, we look at we try to look at everything at at everything we've got access to across all the brands. And there's lots of options. But, you know, generally there there typically are a handful of fixtures that we really like because we've we found them to be reliable. We found them to do what they're supposed to, you know, to do a good job, people to be happy with them, all that jazz. Um, so there's not really like like I would love and I know people have tried this before. I don't know how successful it's been before. I would love to be able to be like, oh, yeah, here is your church lighting package. It's this many dollars and it comes with this stuff and it will do the lighting for your church. But I just, you know, there's just too many variables, right? I mean, we're all lighting designers here. And so, 
you know, when you say, especially, you know, sometimes we throw around the word midsize, people will say we have a midsize stage, a midsize venue. And depending on who Compared you're talking to, to <laughs> the Metropolitan yeah, Opera House, it could be a room <laughs> I mean, that seats 70 people and it could be a room that seats like 4,000 people, right? You know, and so I think there's just, I would love to be able to package things up that way. And I'm always trying to think of creative ways to do things like that just to help make the decision process easier for people. But it really comes down to, you know, myself or one of the other designers that works with us just going and being like, okay, hey, how far is the throw distance? And we walk people through how to find that because a lot of times we're working with people who their full-time thing is not lighting. You know, it's media or worship or, you know, whatever. Um, And, you know, we find out the throw distances and find out what they already have, how it's working for them, how we could possibly implement that in a a different way, um, just reusing some of the stuff they have. And, you know, we, that's how we start to determine um, what fixtures we're going to recommend. And so, you know, I wish I wish there could be a typical package. Um, but, you know, another thing actually we, we do kind of in that same vein is, you know, when you're thinking about a church or a venue, kind of one of the first decision points once you've figured out throw distance and stuff like that is, well, is there haze in the space on a regular basis? Are they using atmosphere in the room? Right. Because if you are, you stick a lot more stuff behind the people. But if you're not then you want some fixtures with some good gobos that'll look good on the walls or you're picking fixtures that do pixel mapping or that you're just going to see with your eye different cells, different pixels, stuff like that, um, because, you know, you're not seeing those light beams through the air. Um, and so that's definitely some of the thought process um, that w- I like to go through. Um, and I would I would love to have a typical lighting package, but. I just, you know, <laughs> It's a little too hard to say, oh, yeah, this is the package for all music clubs, right? <laughs> right. Every place is different. You know, every, it's like every show is yeah. different. Okay, I've got this three-part question. I just came up with it. It's not in the script. Ooh. All right, and Ellen's going to love this question. You, you, you may love it, too, hopefully. First, one. <laughs> first, <laughs> first, how does one start their own business to be a dealer? Okay. Second, as a dealer... How does a show like LDI serve you? And three, at shows like LDI, are there any of these like underhanded cash, you know, things going on in those rooms that we never get to go in except you're a dealer or manufacturer? I want to know the dirt, all right? You can't ask that question. I just did. I asked him. He doesn't have to answer it. Yeah, right. Are we naming manufacturers? No, 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 no. 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 We're not naming. No names, no no names. So the first part was how to become a dealer, right? right? Yeah, um, if someone so, wants to, you know, to start their own business, how do they? How do you do that? I mean, you obviously you're a small business person. How does one become that? I mean, how do you do it? Yeah, ultimately, it's it's kind of interesting. Is is you know, I started in the world right as a lighting designer, doing shows, you know, working for a company, then being freelance, and then as Learn Stage Lighting grew and. Um, and you know, we were doing this, running this as just training, like teaching people, doing paid training courses, working with manufacturers. And then manufacturers actually started reaching out to me, which was a little different just because we had such a wide range of people we talked to and they were like, Hey, you should really consider becoming a dealer. So what that basically entails is, you know, a couple a little bit of money and a couple of pieces of paperwork, um, <laughs> essentially, um, and a place you to know, store it's a little things more, probably, right? Yeah, Yeah. possibly a place to store things, though, you know, our philosophy in sales is that we want to have as many options for the customer as possible, many different brands, all the SKUs that they have, which is thousands and thousands of items. So, of course, we don't stock that. We stock, you know, the things we sell the very most often. But all of these manufacturers have warehouses that they're happy to drop ship from. Um, And so it's not that even as much. It's more... A lot of times on the application, they're looking for, um, you know, which this is a little bit of a hard part in Nashville, Tennessee, is they say, hey, we don't want a new dealer in an area where we have too many dealers. If they're just going to be someone who goes in and just starts knocking on doors saying, hey, I can get you that for less money. Right. You know, that's that's not good. Nobody likes low ballers because they just kind of destroy the industry at times. Right. Um, You know, if somebody just kind of goes around. Um, And then the second part is, yeah, once you're approved, essentially, as a dealer for a company, there's often a certain uh, order that you have to make to get started a certain quantity. 
Uh, and that quantity in dollars is going to depend generally on the, the quality of the fixtures, right? So the DJ lines, it's less. The professional lines of lights, it's more. But at the same time, you know, not to give away all the industry secrets, but with some of the higher end manufacturers, it's not really even about a buy-in. It's really just about them seeing that you're legitimate, you're doing this, you have a good reputation, you want to partner with them. Um, and there may not be a buy-in for some, for some brands um, at all. Uh, so part two, then, what do we like about LDI as a dealer? Oh, and part three was about the cash under the no, table. We don't have to go to part three because, you know, I, but, but the part two is important because especially as a smaller dealer, because we, you know, we see all these big dealers there all the time, you know, and, and, uh, but for the small business person, I mean, what do you look for at LDI? Absolutely. So, I mean, the unfair advantage that I have is that I do live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, <laughs> That's true. And so I'm not in South Dakota. If I was in South Dakota, you know, a show like LDI would be the one time a year that, or maybe the one or two times a year that I'm in a place where I get to actually see the new fixtures from these different brands that I'm a dealer for. Right. Uh, now I'm not in South Dakota. I'm in Nashville, which means they come here. Um, but, but it is the one time, and, and there's a couple really beneficial things that happen at LDI for a dealer. Um, number one is, you know, we're getting to see the newest of the new when it comes out for the products that release at LDI. Obviously, you know, products also release at uh, ProLite in Europe. You know, they also release at Infocom. But a fair amount does release at LDI. And, you know, that's when they first give us our pricing. We have the first opportunity to order these new products. If there's something that we just go, oh, man, that's such a great fit for our people, you know, to get first in line on that, um, because often they're not shipping right away when they first announce them. Um, sometimes it's, it's significantly later, but we, we don't like that very much. Um, but uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the, the next part of it is discovering uh, new manufacturers. So. I have always, since the first time I went to LDI 2018, 2017, something like that, um, have just gone and tried to walk by every single booth on the floor, which is hard to do, um, especially when you know people, uh, <laughs> because then you stop and talk all the time. Um, but it, you would be surprised. Obviously, you know, there's there's always tons and tons of booths that are just kind of like, eh, I've heard of them. Oh, that doesn't really that doesn't look like a good fit for our people. But every year there are multiple booths where we see something that just sparks something as we go. Oh, this is something that we didn't have that would be a really good fit for what we're doing. And a lot of times, you know, those small booths sometimes turn into big booths years later. Um, it, it's oftentimes new things that people who maybe worked for another manufacturer are trying out or doing a small business, you know, or whatever. Um, and there can really be some, some incredible things in those small booths. Um, and then probably the third thing, most importantly that we do at LDI is it really does help us as a dealer to talk to the people we're emailing, um, you know, on the manufacturer side to get their opinions about things, to look at, to, you know, be right there with the fixtures and say, Hey, we come across this situation. And a lot of times we do that fixture, but we're not, you know, entirely happy with it. You know, how can we kind of solve this problem better? And they often have uh, really great ideas on how to do that. Or they take the feedback and, you know, you say, Hey, we really love this fixture, but we wish it did such and such. And in a year or two, you might see a fixture that does such and such, uh, which is great. If you saw a product in a booth that was looking for an American distributor, would you pick something up and handle it yourself? Uh, that is something that I've stayed out of to this point, <laughs> but I'm not against it. Definitely not against it. Um, especially as, as a company where every day we inch closer and closer to needing a real warehouse. That's not just storage spaces right. <laughs> and for our, for our inventory. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those things that we always have our eye on for sure. Hmm. Uh, do you also ever send anybody or check yourself the, uh, used gear? Uh, there's some, you know, very reputable, uh, used gear companies out there now where you might be able to get a church, uh, like a, you know, a used, Grand, well, not to mention a good console or better lighting <laughs> from the used market than from the new market. 
Absolutely. We do definitely refer people over to places like that a lot. Yeah. It just kind of depends on what they're doing. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing with used gear is always like, especially anything that has moving parts, but even LEDs, like it can be tough to know how much abuse they've had on the road previous. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple of the, the really big production companies out there that obviously sell their own stuff. Some of them take better care of their stuff than others. (laughs) And, you know, I, I have seen some horror stories there. And so it's, it can be a tough, it can be a tough thing. It, I think buying used gear, especially from these big production companies, if, if you have somebody like this happens with churches a lot and we see this and it's great where you've got somebody on staff or a volunteer that's really handy with fixing things and they want to save a bunch of money and buy new gear. And it works out really well for them. Um, But, you know, especially with moving fixtures, you know, there's so many sensors and motors and belts. And, you know, if you're competent with fixing that stuff, then when a light goes down or has an issue, it's not a big deal. But if you're not competent with that, then that's probably not going to be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I've been in the middle of those nightmares, believe me. And I'm going to let you get off because uh, I'm going to throw a quick audible to that third part of the question that you've conveniently avoided. <laughs> oh, and I'm just going to ask forgot. you, which manufacturer has the best party at LDI? Because hmm. I know you're invited to all of them. We don't get invited. Design, <laughs> they don't want designers there. Because we're not going to order any equipment. But I want to know, because I've snuck into a few. (laughs) I have snuck into a few. And some were really great and some weren't so great. Do you have any, like, a group of favorites, you know, or... Yeah, I'm not a hard partier, uh, uh, but <laughs> it's Vegas. <laughs> You're gonna be in Vegas for God's sake, you know. <laughs> but man, back before, I would say I, I know there were some really good Martin ones that yes. I stepped in on back before. Back before they were bought. That's <laughs> right. A long time ago. You're right. There were you some know, back awesome... when they had the really big boots. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I still I still want to hear about the cash. I mean, do deals like that happen in this industry? I, I have reasonable suspicion that they do <laughs> well they certainly they certainly i mean it's legitimate but they certainly happen on the last day i'm not sure that cash changes hands in those no, demo rooms. Of course i think not. that yeah. people really have you know stuff that's not ready for you know the big market but they want to show it to special people and see you know get sure. opinions and test it a little bit and Oh, yeah. No, I mean, the the special invited rooms. Now, I've been in those before. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, And yeah, yeah. those are exactly like you're saying, Ellen. Sometimes they're sometimes they're new fixtures that are ready, but they're just, you know, they've got something that's considerably different than what's out there on the market. And they want to protect that a little bit more. You know, like one time I remember I was back, you know, the Avo D9, right? The big red console that they have now. Um, They're they're top of the line thing Um, like a year and a half before it came out, they had it at LDI, but it was, it was, it was actually, it was at a different location. It wasn't on the show floor. And it was like, it was this weird thing where like you had to know somebody and they brought you behind this drape wall into this tiny room and you could see the thing. And so, you know, <laughs> these things happen. I think, I think though it's, it's more about the, the closed room stuff is more about uh, protecting that intellectual property. Yeah. Of yeah. The well, you sometimes out. have to sign an NDA. I've, I've been invited to several of those for yeah. either prototypes or new products that, like you said, were not introduced on the show and floor, but they want to get feedback from not only dealers, but from design as well. Um, so I, I find that really, that's one of my favorite parts of LDI actually, um, you know, being a part of all that. Steve, do you have a, another question? I was just going to say, I've, I've watched some of your videos um, and it seems to me, uh, from what I've seen, you've got a pretty good handle on how to generate a budget-friendly console uh, maybe you mix and match a little bit, but you seem to get a lot out of consoles that aren't, you know, the price of a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I think that's the amazing thing about the, the year we live in 2023 as well, is that essentially like I, I love a big console as much as everybody else does. You know, I, I have <laughs> one sitting over there that's fairly good size. And, you know, they're great when you're a production company and all that. But at the end of the day, 
you know, these consoles are all running the software and the PC version is nowadays literally the same software, right? Just running on a PC. Um, there's not, it used to be that they were different things or like PC versions, you know, like I learned on the, uh, ETC expression express, you know, mm-hmm. those ones, right. I learned on those first, right. And the PC app was terrible and you couldn't output and it wasn't like, it wasn't the same thing. It was just kind of a weird offline editor, you know, today it's, it's not like that at all. You know, you can run all of these major consoles on a PC, you know, get less expensive hardware to output and, if you're not in the place where you have all these different designers touching the console and stuff, and you don't have it going out in rentals and stuff, like a lot of times, if it's a church or a music venue or someone's personal gear, you can run it on a PC, you know, depending on the manufacturer, they have different ways of licensing it. A lot of times, you know, buying different pieces of hardware allows you to to get different features. But, you know, a lot of times it's like, hey, you can do everything you need to do uh, if in a budget setting for not a lot of money on console, um, that's, that's always been a big thing for me is, is when I see somebody and they come to us and even if it's somebody with a decent budget, but the console takes up like a quarter of their budget, I say, Hey, let's look at that because today there's options. Like you can go with a smaller setup or maybe, maybe, you know, even though I know people don't like this, you can look at another brand that you might not have considered before of, of console. Right. Um, I recently did something and maybe Steve saw this. We, we had a video not too long ago about, hey, does it matter what console I use? And somebody commented on that video and they said, hey, just to illustrate this point that I kind of made in that video, this person wrote their own software and was doing shows at a small theater with it, <laughs> with the software that they wrote on their own um, that was outputting DMX. And they were like, you know, the point remains like, does the audience know what console's being used? No. They don't. Right. Um, And sure, there are situations that warrant a top end console and it makes sense and whatnot. But I think a lot of times you can make, you know, all of these consoles are way better than they were 10 years ago. (laughs) They're way more effective. You can do a lot on pretty much any of the big name consoles out there. And sometimes, um, especially when we're working with folks that are not in a professional setting, we're going to look at pieces of software or consoles that aren't the typical names that professionals go to because they're better suited for entry-level people. Yeah, very interesting. (laughs) Thank God that those these PC versions are a lot more reliable than they used to be. Yes. Unfortunately, a lot of companies bought these consoles to run their professional shows and they would crash all the time. It was just a real problem. And I have more horror stories about that too that I don't want to relive again. Well, we still get calls here um, at SMU. There, some church will call us and say, uh, "Do you have someone who can come by and, you know, program the?" Uh, uh, and I'll just say it: the Grand MA, uh, Brother Bob left. He moved Brother to you know, Denver, <laughs> and no one knows how to turn the thing on. So you got a point there. You know who who is your clientele, and how much interest do they really have in learning a state of the art console? And to be fair, sometimes manufacturers, even even the larger, higher pro line man- manufacturers, they can create turkeys as well. The L- <laughs> remember the LP ninety. <laughs> okay, I, I, that was the first console that I spec'd for the Greer Garson Theater, and unfortunately, at the time, Strand had basically sold the company. And they, and the new ownership decided not to service that. Oh, no. Yeah, this yeah. is a super high end console. That must be very difficult for a dealer when you're selling equipment and uh, that that you're working with companies that will support the uh, product. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge consideration um, and something that we we take really seriously. Not only like how long they'll support it, but like what's their you know what's the company's history of when stuff gets older, you know, what do they do? What's their support like there, right? Like, you know, we all know, obviously, you know, MA2 to MA3, you know, or, you know, if you're from hog three to four, there's some hardware that works, some that doesn't, you know, there's always, you want to look at what manufacturers have done in the past and be like, hey, 
if they come out with a new version of their software next year, is what I'm buying now going to be, you know, completely unusable with the new software? Am I going to be stuck on the old thing? Right. Because a lot of time the history of what they've done in the past is going to, you know, foreshadow into what they'll probably do in the future. Um, and so that's definitely something we pay attention to when we recommend stuff to people. Um, can we go back to learn stage lighting and who are your clients? Who are you teaching to? Absolutely. So we basically break down courses and teaching into generally bands, DJs, community and smaller theaters and um, churches. Um, and so those are kind of the four groups that we we serve the most. Um, and in general, they are, you know, basic to intermediate level users, generally not professional users in there, though. Um, we dive deeply and we use Onyx a lot um, from Elation. And, you know, we've got tutorials on every feature of that software. So we get professional users in on, on that portion of it. Um, but most of our people are definitely in that basic to intermediate level across those four kind of niches. That's great. Yeah, it's wonderful that you are in education as well, because as you know, from listening to our show, uh, we're all teachers. So, <laughs> so we're kind of in education as well. So what do you think is going to be the next big thing in lighting? Whether it's budget, whether it's budget or it's millions of dollars, where, where, what do you think is coming next? You know, it's one of those things I feel like we've been saying for a few years, like what's the next big thing, right? Like at, at something like LDI, which is coming up really soon, you know, the past few years, it's like the existing technology gets refined every year, right? There's these laser sources that came out for beam fixtures, you know, they're, they're somewhat usable in the U S but there's some paperwork to dive through and whatnot, um, there. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I've seen some cool things lately where, you know, folks in video production are starting to use LED wall panels as lighting sources, which is really cool um, to just use video walls as lighting sources. Um, certainly video walls themselves are becoming more and more popular than they used to be, but they're not really new in that sense. Um, you know, we're, we're always on the lookout for new stuff, but that's that's one that constantly stumps me because people ask it and I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I would love to see on the control side um, easier, like patching and configuration and setup, you know, like like you have, you know, I know ETC, I think in the color source and whatnot, you can go reach out on RDM and like auto address stuff. Um, but we haven't really seen that you know, broadly in the industry, right? In general, when you start a show on any of the major consoles, you patch everything individually, and then everybody goes and sticks that into the fixtures. But the fixtures do all communicate, I believe they communicate their serial number over RDM or some other kind of unique identifier, which, you know, in my mind would kind of be able to make a bridge there to somehow auto connect the rig with the patch and have it work automatically you know, maybe with a camera involved. Um, and, and, you know, that that to me would be really awesome <laughs> as something new. But in terms of light sources, I, I don't know. I, I want to see what the engineering departments come up with. Well, I have <laughs> I have a patented idea that I'm trying to sell to a manufacturer with a lot of money. And that is the personal sphere. It's a giant ball that you're in and you can walk and the ball will rotate. And the inside uh -huh. is all LED so yeah, you can like walk anywhere because yeah. if you want to like walk in Venice, but you're like in Brooklyn, you just plug Venice in and as you're walking. This thing is rolling. You're inside it, right? It has a little air conditioning in it. And, <laughs> and you see Venice go by you in 360 degrees. Much better than those stupid goggles, you know. This thing is like we've already, we already know that the sphere works on a giant yeah. scale. Just <laughs> shrink it down. That's so what happens when you run into the wall. It's, it's rubberized. It's okay, because we're going to have everybody in these things. That's it. You're never going to see another person, except if they're in a projection in the sphere. It's, it's really what's happening. I, I, I see a sponsor coming. <laughs> and I, 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 think, I think there's some, some I'm interest to sell this idea, A personal sphere, or sphere for you, or something like that. I don't know. Something like the that. The problem is ne Neiman Marcus has gone under. 
Oh. That they would be the perfect, <laughs> they did? perfect oh, for no. this. I think oh, did so. they really? Yeah. I think I think they're online only now. Oh okay. no. I was gonna say years ago I well I could I can't say who, but uh, somebody someone that I worked with had the name Needless Markup for them. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but aren't great. they the ones that always had the Christmas catalog with some one million dollar object you could buy? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah. right here in Dallas. <laughs> in the right. ground zero for them. Yep. Yep. Well, David, I can, we've run out of time, but it has been a pure pleasure talking to you. I must tell you, uh, it wasn't what I was expecting, and I love it. I love it. I, you're a nice, really nice person. You are as far away from the typical salesperson that I know that I've ever met. I've never met anyone like you, and you're just really genuine. And obviously, you care about the art and you care about education, and we think that is just fantastic. And make sure you visit the Light Talk podcast. That's at right. LDI. You be there. It's a Sunday That's at right. four p.m. What? Sunday at four. Right. We right. will be there. Okay, <laughs> good. It was right before happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tell us that once again you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website at lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook. And subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the Snoot Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sister, coming to you from Long Beach, St. Bart's, Nashville, Tennessee, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans that serve you much more of our budget casserole of nonsense. (laughs) Light Talk, Light Talk, Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. Well, thank you again, David, for being with us, and we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye. See you, everybody.